if he does not have any photos of a young trumpet player from the mid 90s, I think he'll put that on for tomorrow if you ask him. So frequently throughout the day, ask Mr. Pa Pastor Dan if he has any pictures of a young trumpet player from the mid 90s from Shay that. Yeah. I'll have to Google that, Randy. Yeah. <laughs> See if I can find one. I can find one if you don't. I might have to wait. I might wait for Throwback Thursday. That would be all right. So. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was pretty weak. I, I know Alex just prayed for you to be awake, but I don't think God's answered that prayer yet. So let me hear you again. Are you awake this morning? Amen. Yeah. All right. All right. Here's the deal. I have to stay awake in chapel, so you have to stay awake in chapel, right? That's only fair, right? All right. I think we can come to an agreement about that. Well, we're talking about grace, and last, last week, yesterday, feels like a week, yesterday we talked about being occupied by grace, the fact that, that God comes and lives in us, and he occupies us with his incredible grace. And this morning, as we continue to think about grace, we're going to talk about how grace sets us free. I thought uh, that I'd start off by telling you a little story about a time where grace set me free. Would you like to hear that? It involves a police officer. <laughs> that whets your appetite. Uh, several years ago, my wife and I were um, down in, uh, we were in Moorhead City, North Carolina, and we were getting things set up for a youth mission trip that we were going to be taking later that summer. And we uh, drove down from where we lived in Virginia, and we spent some time looking around the town, uh, looking at the mission projects we were going to do, and fig figuring things out. And we checked into our hotel, and we had dinner, and yeah, about 11 o'clock as we were getting ready for bed, we realized that neither of us packed the toothpaste. Both of us thought the other person packed the toothpaste. And we had a real kind, sweet conversation about it. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, you figured that out. And so uh, at the uh, conclusion of the conversation, I said, well, I'm going to go to Walmart and get some toothpaste. Even though I probably could have went down to the front desk and asked, but I, to make my point very clear, I was going to go to Walmart. So I went to Walmart and navigated the craziness that Walmart is at 11 o'clock at night. And uh, it's not that it's so crowded, but there's some really strange people at Walmart at 11 o'clock <laughs> at night. So I got... And I was one of them. And so I got the toothpaste and a few other things we needed. And I was kind of just cruising back to the hotel and just trying to think about having a better attitude. And all of a sudden, there were blue lights in my rearview mirror. And I thought, oh, great. Is this really going to get any better? And so he uh, pulled me over. And I really I wasn't even thinking about how fast I was going. And he said, did you know that the speed limit was 35 through here? I said, no, that's why I was doing 50. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, he asked for my license and he asked for my insurance card and I couldn't find it. I didn't know where my wife had put it and so I was looking for that and, and I'm apologizing to him and he said, stop. And he had asked me, he said, you know, why are you out tonight? I said, here's what's going on. I told him the whole story. My wife forgot the toothpaste. <laughs> I figured it wouldn't hurt. It was true. And so he said, stop. He said, look, just remember it's 35 through here. Have a great night. <laughs> All right. And so he showed me incredible grace. And you know what? It felt great to get grace. And one of the things that it made me feel was free. There was something freeing about getting grace, isn't there? Grace sets us free. I, I want you to have that in your mind and in your heart this morning. That grace is something that sets you free. And to help us to see and to feel just how God's grace sets us free. I want us to look at a story in John chapter 8. So if you have your Bible this morning, we're going we're gonna to be in John chapter 8 as we see a story of how Jesus demonstrated the incredible freedom that grace brings. And as you're uh, turning to John chapter 8, just to, to set some perspective for this story, in Jesus' day, there were a group of people, they were religious leaders, they were part of a sect of Judaism known as the Pharisees who took the Bible, God's Word, of course it was the Old Testament, but they took God's Word very seriously. They knew all about it, they memorized it, they tried to live it out as, as perfectly as they could. They were, they were very religious. They were very knowledgeable. They had a lot of information in their minds about God. They also had a lot of opinions about how God should deal with people and how God should treat people. And really, we could simply put it as this. They believed that some people deserved God's grace and other people didn't. They believed that, that God should be fair. 
they really had a flawed concept of, of grace. They thought grace was something that could be earned. They thought grace was something that could be deserved and it could be withheld from the undeserving. Now, I'm thankful that that was a long time ago and that never ever happens today, right? Right? I mean, there's never, I mean, we don't deal with that in the church today that there are people that think that they're better than other people, right? We don't have that problem today. But it happened a long time ago, right? <laughs> I think you figured that out. You see, when grace happens to us, it feels amazing. But when grace happens to other people, sometimes it doesn't. Did you ever notice that? You know, I felt so good when that officer said, go have a good night, go free. No punishment, no penalty, no tickets, no hard conversation with your wife. But you know what? I've been driving down the road and been passed before. And what did I think? I hope there's a cop up there, right? I hope he pulls them over and I hope they get what they deserve. Anybody ever have a feeling like that? <laughs> Alright. See, when you get pulled over, you want grace, but when someone else gets pulled over, you want them to get. Maybe that'll teach them to slow down. You see, when grace happens to others, it doesn't always seem good and it doesn't always seem fair. How many of you had a mom who told you life's not fair? Anybody? Alright. That means you have a great mom, all right? I know something about your mom already. She is wonderful because she told you the truth. Life isn't fair, is it? God isn't fair. And grace isn't fair. I want to ask you a question. Because we have this tendency to want to make it fair. And God doesn't do fair. But have you ever had someone look down on you? Ever have someone put you down? Ever have someone tell you that you were worthless? not valuable, not important, made to feel unwelcome or unloved or unaccepted. How many of you have had that happen by somebody who claimed to represent God, a follower of Christ? Somebody that should have never done that. Well, if that's happened to you, I want you to know that God has a message for you today. And so as we look at John chapter 8, we're going to see an incredible message of God's grace. Let's just look at the first six and a half verses of John chapter 8, and then we'll Move a little further through the chapter this morning. But John chapter 8, and, and it begins, Then each went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Let's just imagine and think about what's going on in this scene. Here we find that Jesus is in the temple. He is teaching. So let's just think they're in a courtyard and they're having a church service. Are you with me? And Jesus is teaching, and the people are listening, and in the middle of all that, these men drag a woman into the middle of the service, and they say, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. What do we do, Jesus? Because the law says we get to stone her. And here's the thing, they already had the rocks in their hands. They dragged her up in front of the crowd and they pronounced her sin and they wanted her to get what she had coming what she deserved and here's the thing she was guilty of sin can you imagine what it was like for her can you put yourself in her shoes this morning we don't know how the situation went down but it's likely that she was probably a prostitute and they find this woman and they drag her out of her bedroom and they drag her through the streets of the town and you can imagine the looks that she got. You can imagine the comments that she heard. Not just from the men that were dragging her through the streets but through the onlookers. They drag her into the courtyard of the temple and there's Jesus teaching and they parade her up in front of them and pronounce her sin. And the whole thing is just so sad because they didn't even really care about her. The whole situation was just set up so that they could catch Jesus in a predicament. 
Right? They wanted to trap Jesus. They always wanted to do that. They wanted to catch him. They wanted to give him a question that he couldn't answer, a problem that he couldn't solve. They wanted to prove that they were smarter than he was. Because they didn't like him and his ways, and they didn't like his message and his grace. Because they thought that there were some people that deserved grace themselves. They deserved a relationship with God. They had earned a relationship with God. They were religious and they were respected and they obeyed the external laws. Unlike this woman. They didn't care about her. Have you ever felt used? Have you ever felt like somebody just used you to get what they want? That you were just somebody that they were using? Well, that's exactly how she felt. No one. I mean, the Roman government didn't care what the Jews did with a Jewish woman. Women didn't have any value in that society. The Bible has always elevated the status of women. But this society did not. And so there was no one to stand up for her. The government wouldn't stand up for her. The people of God, well, they were the ones that had the rocks in their hands. There was no one to stand up for her. No one to represent her. She was guilty, and God's representatives had rocks in their hands, ready to bring judgment. Can you imagine the tension that morning in the temple courtyard? I'm pretty sure that the, the sermon stopped, and I'm pretty sure that you could hear a pin drop in the temple. I don't think the birds were chirping. I don't think the crickets were cricketing. All right? I'm not exactly sure what you call that sound. Chirping as well? All right. I learned something new today. I prefer to call it cricketing. <laughs> I think you will now too. <laughs> the tension is thick. I mean, you could cut the tension with a knife. What is Jesus going to say? How is Jesus going to respond? We can imagine that the crowd felt the tension, but this woman, put yourself in her shoes. Put yourself in her place this morning. Can you imagine the tension that she felt? The anxiety, the fear. They're looking down on her. Look at what happens. Look back in chapter 8, verse 6. So they're asking Jesus, what do you say, Jesus? What do you have? And it says this, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. Jesus says nothing. He just stoops down and starts writing in the dirt. A lot of theories about what Jesus was writing. I'm sure you've heard them, right? That maybe he was writing out some verses or maybe he was writing out their sins. He may just have been doodling. Alright? That's my theory. Because that's what I would have been doing. The woman's accusers were looking down on her. They they had no regard for her life. In fact, they were ready to kill her. They had no value placed on her. None. They looked down on her. She was nothing to them. She was garbage to them. She was dirty. She was sinful. And she meant nothing to them. And they looked down on her. Maybe you know what it's like to be looked down on. And Jesus stoops down. So that as they look down on her, they have to look even further down to see him. He says nothing. And I'm pretty sure they were getting impatient. And so they start to demand an answer. Look at what it says. It says they continued to ask him. So here they are. You can just picture the scene, right? Jesus is down there riding in the dirt and they were ready to stone this woman. And they're like, Jesus, quit stalling. You've got to give us an answer. We demand an answer. But Jesus is just stooping. Max Licato makes the suggestion that Jesus was prone to stooping. Think about it. He stooped to wash the disciples' feet, didn't he? He stooped to embrace children. He stooped to pull Peter out of the sea one night. He stooped to pray in the garden. He stooped before a Roman whipping post and he stooped to pick up the cross. The crowd is growing impatient. They're demanding an answer. And so Jesus stood up. Look at the text there. Look at what it says in verse 7. It says, He stood up. I imagine it was a very powerful moment. And then Jesus says something that no one, no one expected Him to say. 
Not the crowd, not those that were there to be taught, and certainly not the woman. He says, let him who is without sin, what? Cast the first stone. That's exactly what Jesus said. Can you imagine the terror that was going through this woman at this moment? Because she knows the character of these men. And I'm sure she's thinking, I know they have sin, but they don't care about their own sin. They're going to stone me. Jesus says, whoever is without sin can throw the first stone. And the context of his statement and the words that are used imply that Jesus wasn't just saying, whoever is without any sin. He was saying, whoever is without this kind of sin. You can throw the first rock. And as she is expecting to hear the sound of rocks flying through the air towards her, she instead hears a different sound. First it's just one, but it's a thud. Thump. It's a rock, not hitting her, but the ground. And John's account in John chapter 8 says it began with the oldest. He dropped his rock. And he walked away. And then the next... And the next, and all of a sudden the courtyard was filled with the sound of dropping rocks. Then footsteps as they walked away. And then we find the woman alone with Jesus. And he asks her a pivotal question. He says, where are your accusers? Where are are your accusers. The ESV says, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? You see, the thing is, we all have accusers, don't we? Have you ever felt the voice of accusation? We all have accusers. And oftentimes, the voice of accusation rings in our head, that voice that says you're not good enough, that you're a failure, that you don't measure up. Have you ever heard that voice? The reason that you hear accusation is because you have an enemy called Satan. And in the book of Revelation, he's described as an accuser. He loves to accuse you. And he will accuse you in any way that he can. He'll do whatever he can. And here's the thing. He often contracts out his work. Did you know that? Satan loves to contract out his work. And so he'll find people that will peddle his poison. And he will use them to bring the voice of accusation into your life. Maybe it was a friend that turned their back on you or stabbed you in the back. Maybe it was a preacher that preached great guilt without grace. See, Satan loves to remind us about our past and our problems, doesn't he? Have you ever had just those times where you know you've done something, you've asked God to forgive you, and you know he forgave you, but then you start thinking about it again, and you start to feel guilty about it? Anybody else ever been there? Right? That's not God. If you've dealt with it, if you've confessed it, if you've moved on and he's forgiven you, that voice of accusation is your accuser. He loves to remind you of your past. He loves, you to, he loves to drag you through the streets of your past and remind you of your mistakes, to remind you about your sin, calls you immoral, stupid, dishonest, irresponsible, a failure. But here's the thing that I want you to know this morning. You don't have to listen to that voice. Because here's what you need to know. Jesus stood for you just like he stood for this woman. Jesus stood for you just like he stood for this woman. Look back in John chapter 8. Has no one condemned you? He asks. And she says this in verse 11. No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Can you imagine how she felt in that moment? The only one, the only one who had the right to condemn her chose not to. Can you imagine how she felt? I felt amazing when that police officer said, go free. And that was just a very small temporary thing. But this woman was under the judgment of death. And the law was correct. She deserved it. And Jesus said, neither do I 
condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and live free. Go let grace change your life and your legacy. You see, grace not only forgives us, but it sets us free from the chains of sin. I want you to realize that God's grace sets you and I free. Sin makes you a slave. Sin brings judgment. Sin brings condemnation. Sin brings death. And Jesus came to set you free from the chains of sin. He came to set you free from the bondage of sin. It's why as a child of God, it's why as a follower of Christ, He calls us to deal with the sin in our life. He's already paid for it and we're forgiven. Our position in Christ means that we belong to Him forever. We don't earn it. It's not about performance. But He wants us to deal with the sin in our life because sin makes you a slave. It entangles your life and Jesus wants you to live free. And again, in the context of this verse, He's saying, when He says, go and sin no more, He's not saying go and be perfect. Right? He knew that she would still commit sin. But what was he saying? He says, don't go back to the life you were living. Don't go back to the house of prostitution. He says, go and live free. Go and live in my grace. Grace not only forgives, it sets us free from the chains of sin. God is a God who offers grace to sinners like you and like me. And in order to do that, in order to offer us this incredible grace, this ability to look at us and say, go free, even though we're guilty, he had to stoop. In order for Jesus to be able to say that he had to stoop first, before he stood for you, he stooped. He stooped low enough to be born in a manger. Isn't it amazing the circumstances that surrounded Jesus' entrance into this world? Not exactly how you'd expect the king to arrive. And yet it was very intentional because it proclaimed that he had come for everyone. Of every economic status, of every social background, Jesus came. He stooped low enough to be born in a manger. He stooped low enough to be raised in the village of Nazareth. No Jew wanted to be from Nazareth. I had the privilege of going to Israel a few years ago. Our tour guide was Jewish. He took us to the roadside that overlooks Nazareth. And he said, there's Nazareth and we're not going there. I don't want to go to Nazareth. But it's where Jesus stooped low enough to grow up. He stooped low enough to hang out with IRS agents and lepers. Tax collectors. He stooped low enough to be spit on. Low enough to be slapped. Low enough to be nailed to a Roman cross. Low enough to be buried in a tomb. And here's what I want you to know. He chose that. It didn't happen to him. He chose that. Why did he choose that? The Bible says he chose that because of his incredible love for you and for me. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love. His own love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Rest in that thought for a moment. While we were still sinners, what God demonstrated, He didn't just say that He loved us, He demonstrated His own love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Jesus died for you, He died for me, He died for that woman. He paid the penalty for her sin and your sin. He stooped low enough to accept the Father's wrath on your behalf. But here's the thing, He didn't stay dead. Three days later, He stood up for you in Joseph's tomb. He stood up and conquered your sin. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. He stood for that woman who'd been accused and he stood for you. And today he still stands. He stands in defiance of death, in defiance of the grave, in defiance of Satan. And he stands as your advocate and he has taken on the role of a priest. Listen to Hebrews chapter 7 verse 24 and 25. It says, but Jesus remains a priest forever. His priesthood will never end. Therefore he is able once and forever to save everyone who comes to God through him. He's able to save you once and forever because of what he did on the cross and because of his resurrection. And then listen to this. He lives forever to plead with God on their behalf. You have an advocate in heaven, Jesus the righteous. He is your advocate. He has set you free from the chains of sin. He is your high priest and he prays for you. And he stands in your defense. He stands in line of the accusations and says, no, those accusations aren't true anymore. That's my child. And they have inherited my righteousness. 
And so the accusations no longer stick. Here's the thing I want you to understand. Grace sets you free and only grace sets you free. Only Jesus can give you that grace. And it changes everything. No longer is your label dirty, sinner, worthless, slow, dumb, stupid. That's not who you are anymore in Christ. You've been set free. You're alive with Christ. You're accepted. You're his child. You're his masterpiece. And he has set you free. Listen to Romans 8. 33. Went past it. Romans chapter 8, verses 33 through 34. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen as his own? Will God? No. He is the one who has given us right standing. He's given us righteousness. He's clothed you in righteousness. That's who you are now. Verse 34. Who will condemn us? Will Christ Jesus? No, for he is the one who died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting at the place of the highest honor next to God, pleading for us. The only one who has the right to condemn you is pleading for you if you're his child. Isn't that an amazing thought? The only one who has the right to condemn you is pleading for you. John chapter 8, verse 36. Well, let me, before we get there, let me ask you this question. Are you going to trust your advocate or your accuser? Are you going to live in the freedom that God's called you? Or are you going to trust the accuser. Grace that saves you sets you free. John 8 verse 36 says if the Son sets you free you will be free indeed. Free from guilt. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. Free from condemnation. If you're in Christ there's no condemnation. And here's the thing. Free to leave your life of sin. Free to live for the glory of God. And I want you to know that God wants you to live free. He wants you to live and experience in that freedom that he's purchased for you. And I want that for you. I want you to know the freedom that Jesus can give you. He is your advocate. He stood for you. But before he stood, he stooped. And so are you going to trust your advocate or your accuser? Would you bow your heads this morning? We don't know what Jesus wrote in the dirt that day. But it's the only sermon he ever wrote down. Max Licato suggests that it's possible that he wrote, Grace happens here. And God wants to write that same story in your life. He wants your life to be a beautiful story of what only his grace can do. And today, I just want you for just a moment before we leave to just picture that woman in that courtyard. Picture her there in her shame, probably beaten, battered. Alone, terrified, and scared. And there stands Jesus. However you picture him, just picture Jesus standing there. Then stooping down on her behalf. And then standing up as her advocate. And telling her to go free. He's done the same thing for you. Never forget that. And live in the freedom that Jesus has provided. Father, I just pray for each person here this morning. Father, you know their hearts, you know their needs, you know their, their, their struggle. And Father, I just pray that there, if there's anyone here this morning that has never trusted your grace and experienced that freedom, that they would come to you and experience the love and the grace that only you can give. But Father, I pray for each of us that know you. Father, may we never forget that you are our advocate, that you are pleading for us, that you stand for us. And Father, I pray that we would learn to live in the freedom that you have provided for us. And Father, I pray that we would live free from the guilt of our past. I pray that we would live free from the entanglement of sin in our present. And Father, that we would take the words of Jesus and apply them to our lives. That we would go and sin no more. And that we would experience your freedom by your grace and for your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.